All right, good evening. I'm Scott Savage from the American Avalanche Association, and welcome to our panel discussion on forecasting stress and resil resilience, uh, operational issues and innovations. So this panel was originally scheduled as a live event at this fall's ISSW in Bend, Oregon, but an extended power outage prevented it from happening as scheduled. So both the ISSW organizers, as well as the American Avalanche Association, feel this is just such a critical topic for our industry. And we're really excited that our moderator and the panelists have agreed to uh, sit on this virtual event. So thank you in advance. So tonight's plan, we'll have about 45 minutes of presentations from our panel of experts, followed by a 45 minute question and answer session. So we're, we really want to encourage live questions during the Q&A, the question and answer session. So to ask a live question, you'll just need to click the raise hand button, and then we'll call on you and ask you to unmute your microphone. So if you'd prefer to ask a written question, which is fine, you can do that at any time, but please recognize that the panelists won't answer the question until during the question and answer session, which will start about 45 minutes into the tonight's event. Um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our panelists and moderator. So I'm gonna give a brief introduction to each of our esteemed guests here. So Melis Cody. Melis is the executive director of the Alaska Avalanche School. Previously, she worked as a climbing ranger for Denali National Park as a mountaineering and climbing guide and as a Knowles field instructor, also teaching wilderness medicine. Melis is a passionate educator who has guided, instructed, skied, or climbed on all seven continents. So welcome, Melis. Tucker Chenoweth. Tucker is the South District Ranger for Denali National Park and Preserve, where he oversees the mountaineering and search and rescue programs, among other things. Tucker previously worked as a ski patroller, mountaineering ranger, mountain guide, ski guide, and avalanche educator. After decades of search and rescue work and helping coworkers and families through tragic experiences, Tucker is striving to increase awareness of the long-term mental health challenges for those in search and rescue careers. Then we have our third panelist, Brian Lazar. Brian is the deputy director of the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. He's worked in the Northern and Southern hemispheres as a mountain guide, an avalanche educator, curriculum developer, and as a former executive director of ARI, all before he joined the CAIC. Brian also served as a member of the American Avalanche Association's Education Committee. Brian previously worked as a consultant investigating snowpack runoff and the effects of climate change. And our moderator this evening, so Laura McLadry, has been a driving force in both acknowledging and addressing stress injuries, resilience, and mental health in the avalanche world. She's a nurse practitioner by training with a background in emergency humanitarian and wilderness medicine. Laura works as a psychiatric provider and as an instructor for the University of Colorado nursing programs. Laura founded the Responder Alliance and volunteers as an advisor for Portland Mountain Rescue and the Eldora Ski Patrol. So without further ado, take it away, Laura. Thanks, Scott, and welcome, everybody, and thanks for the honor of being the moderator. <clears throat> I'm really thankful that we have an opportunity to, to bring some of these innovations um, back into the conversation, so thanks for having the panel um, now in December. So as we get started, um, I thought I'd let me see if I can share my screen with everybody here and put it into slide mode, maybe. Um, as we get started, um, I thought I'd just give you the littlest bit of context to how the panel came about. And it's just, it's really fun to see the names on this call. Many of you were either involved or have been involved with other initiatives. Um, I have the pleasure of founding and leading the Responder Alliance, um, which is an organization really um, of, of many, many um, of you and people uh, now around the world who have been working to advance the conversation on stress injury prevention, but also longevity and vitality in the fields that we love, which seems to equate to um, really risk management and retention and some of the other issues that we're all facing um, in snow work and in our fields. So um, I have had the pleasure to work with everyone on this panel. I wanted to also acknowledge that Terry O'Connor, who was originally on the, pan the panel, is in Dubai. 
uh, working to, to mitigate climate change tonight, so he won't be joining us. And so we asked Brian Lazar, who also presented with me, to, to bring some of that innovation. Um, and a few of the other authors um, are on this call might, might um, chime in as we get started as well. So um, I do also just want to acknowledge that um, there are many organizations, not just the Responder Alliance, who have been working um, really tirelessly on this effort. So um, thinking about SOAR and Mountain Muskox and the A3 Resiliency Fund, which we'll talk about a little bit more, and um, the Climbing Grief Fund and a lot of organizations that we work um, elbow to elbow and shoulder to shoulder with. So with that, um, I'm gonna transition us to the conversation, the panelists. Um, one interesting theme uh, came out during ISSW and after um, really thinking about the amount of effort and energy we and um, all of us, you who are in snow science and research are putting into mitigating and preventing um, injuries from avalanche. And it really brought us to this question, um, thinking about maybe the most likely thing to end or shorten our career in snow safety, not being an avalanche, but perhaps stress impact um, or stress injury. So it, made, it led us to think about, are we mitigating the, the only hazard here with avalanche or should we think, be thinking about stress? So with that, I wanna get the opinion of our experts tonight. Um, and we're gonna start with, with um, Tucker Chenoweth. And the first question for our panel tonight is, is where or how have you um, witnessed stress impact or even traumatic stress with the folks that you serve from your vantage point as a leader? So Tucker, I'm gonna pass that over to you and then advance some slides. Let me know where to go next. Okay, thank you. I uh, appreciate being uh, on this call and part of this community. Uh, it's been a kind of a long career path for me and uh, I kind of ended up here in Denali. Uh, you know, our team up here is relatively small there's 10 Rangers and then we have about six support staff. Uh, and then we bring on a bunch of um, volunteers as well to help support our mountain operations. We, we're in charge of uh, search and rescue, visitor resource protection uh, in a very difficult environment, as I'm sure some of you have ventured into the park and been uh, in the Alaska Range or on Denali. Uh, we have a difficult job. It's a huge area, uh, over 6 million acres. And we're basically in charge of all the mountains. So uh, this small team uh, is the point of the spear for all rescue operations in the area. Uh, you can advance slide. We have a really complicated uh, program. Uh, it's got, uh, it's aviation based to get to the park. We have to travel 50 miles just to get to the park. So there's no road access on our side. So uh, it's very, you know, I guess, uh, high risk in some regards with all the components of the environment and the aviation layer and then the altitude uh, and, of course, the weather concerns that we have. Um, you can advance slide. Uh, Denali, uh, highest peak in North America, has a long history, and with that, uh, comes a lot of uh, tragedy. This is our climber memorial that's in Talkeetna at the cemetery. And on this list, there's basically a uh, all the all the individuals that have had accidents uh, and passed away in the Alaska Range and on Denali and Foraker. Um, you know, this starts back as far as 1932. And then uh, on this list here, there's also um, some names of climbing rangers and volunteers. Uh, along the way, and for everybody that's worked here, uh, I come from a long legacy um, of folks that have been a part of this program. And there's a point in time that you can look to a year, and that's the year you started. And then from that moment on, you kind of know every name. Uh, you've been involved at some level in in that uh, event. And, you know, for me, it was in 2001 as a volunteer, and I became a paid ranger. Uh, and when I hit 2001 and I move forward, there's 58 names on that list. And each of us that works here has has the same timestamp. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I look at what has affected our program um, in terms of uh, stress injury, 
um, it kind of goes without saying that in the SAR world and community, um, it's an obvious thing that has been affecting people for a long time. And I think uh, this conversation and what we've been doing over the past few years to at least bring the conversation, give it some um, common language, uh, and I'll get into that later. But um, yeah, our rangers have uh, have been impacted for this by this for a long time, and now we're just starting to like uh, figure out how to how to address it and increase uh, really our longevity in our careers, but also maintaining uh, the stoke and the passion for the reason why we got into this in the first place. Thanks, Tucker. Yeah. Um, Brian. Yeah, thanks everybody. I'm glad we were able to pull this off um, and the squirrel didn't kill the panel um, as well as himself. So I, I want to start by rejecting the title of expert. Um, I am not an expert, particularly in this domain, and suspect that's why I'm here. So uh, our organization is, is pretty big. Uh, so we're a forecasting center with about 30 people now. Some of those don't have field or operational duties, but also incur stress. Um, the other you know, 26 or seven of us that do have operational responsibilities um, are largely divided. We have kind of a management team of four of us that um, oversee anything that needs to be done. And then the rest of our forecasters have primary roles or responsibilities, which includes both backcountry avalanche forecasting, which is maybe the most familiar uh, for most of the avalanche centers um, in the U.S., but then our operation also takes on all the state and uh, federal highways that run through Colorado. And so we've got um, a number of highway stretches that we have to worry about all winter. And of course the highways um, are uh, a big concern for us, but not as publicly facing. And um, I do want to acknowledge that the paper we wrote and submitted in the talk I gave at ISSW included some efforts that we worked on collaboratively with the Snowmass Snow Safety Team. And uh, Gabi Benal, who is one of the uh, co-authors on that paper and helped us do some of the work and has developed the, uh, the phone app that can track daily stress continuum uh, ratings, is here tonight. So um, hopefully we can throw him under the bus for some questions as well. Um, so I want to start by kind of just thanking our staff because I brought this to our staff and I'm just speaking for the CAC at this point, but um, after uh, a need arose and we've got a mix of staff from fairly young folks to, you know, plenty of gray hairs as well. And I wasn't sure how this kind of thing was going to be received, but by and large, even the grumpiest among us um, embraced this kind of like, let's, let's give it a shot. And we're really supportive and appreciative of us kind of even addressing and discussing mental health, which is not something we would have done at the beginning of my career, that's for sure. Uh, and without without participation, at least of some staff members that are going to need it, um, these kind of programs aren't going to succeed. Um, you can go to the next slide, Laura. And I, I told a little bit of a story um, about my motivation for doing this. And, you know, I've been a manager at this organization. This is my 14th season here now. Um, before that worked in guiding and consulting and all these kinds of jobs um, come with different flavors of, of stress. Um, and the avalanche forecasting world um, comes with stress in a variety of ways. Uh, it's not just the operational worry about, you know, people getting caught and killed in avalanches. It's, you know, keeping roadways safe. Um, and so when Glad and I first started talking about our need to do something, um, I was really keen on making sure we addressed both the, the most obvious and the acute stress um, injury or the potential for injury that comes with some of our responsibilities, like responding to accident investigations, maybe dealing with bodies, talking to family members, talking to survivors. Um, that stuff is obviously, it you know, has the potential for causing stress. But I was also just as interested in addressing kind of the chronic stress, the honestly, the wear and tear of an, an operation that is 24 seven and can't really shut it off. We don't stop spinning the chairlifts and go home. This goes on all the time. And that can really wear people down depending on the season. And um, those are two sources of stress. But what I've also come to realize is that people have and should 
very much have lives outside of these jobs. And sometimes those lives aren't running smoothly. And so people are just experiencing stress that may have initiated or outside of the job. And then the job exacerbates or compounds those problems. And so for years, as my role in a manager, as a role in a manager, I would talk to peers or colleagues after some kind of stressful event, you know, an accident investigation, a body recovery, whatever it may be. And you'd be like, hey, how you doing? You know, that one was pretty gory. And for my whole career, both in guiding and in this forecasting operation, you know, the, the universal answer was like, yeah, yeah, I'm doing fine. Like, I'm fine. I'm fine. And sometimes you believed them and sometimes you didn't. But that's usually where the conversation stopped or started and stopped. Um, and then I had a younger a uh, staff member working for me who had some stress going on, which wasn't actually related to the job, but the job wasn't making it that much better. And so I reached out and I was just like, you know, hey, how are you doing? And he said, I'm not doing great. Like I could really use some help. And I was like dumbfounded. I did not know what to do with that response. Um, I had a list of like resources that the state of Colorado provides me. So I could point them to the Department of Natural Resources and I'd be like, like, here's a list of resources or like you can call or go to these websites for like professional counseling. And as Glad's made clear, you know, this stress stuff um, isn't a light switch that turns on and off. And a lot of people weren't even at this stage where they needed professional help. They were just asking for support. And I just couldn't provide an adequate answer. And it left me feeling, you know, pretty inadequate as a manager and a supervisor. We had another staff member join us and asked me, you know, like, what are we doing about like mental health and stress resiliency? Do we have a team? And I'm like, no, like, what should we do? Um, and I had run into GLAD at a search and rescue event on Vail Pass in the midst of these conversations. And we were off on the side while the media was filming stuff for the TV. And we just got talking and I was kind of aware of what she was doing. I'm like, well, I need, I need to do something here at the, at the CAIC. So what should we do? And Glad pointed me to this Ronda Alliance and some resources. And then I pushed on her and she pushed back. And I was essentially like, yeah, this is great. These tools are great. I need like a roadmap. I need a, to know exactly what to do. Like, how do I implement this stuff? What do I do when something happens? How do I deal with acute stress? How do I deal with chronic stress? And that's what led to the implementation of, of the program that we presented at the ISSW and some of which we'll, we'll cover tonight with the tools that we're using. And it's not, I can't claim that every staff member at the CAIC um, needs this stuff or wants to do it, but there are some people that want to do it. And so I feel like it's our responsibility for people that manage programs um, to provide that support, um, even if it's not for everyone on your staff. Um, and for those who may not be in management positions, um, if you feel like this is something you need, I think it's your responsibility to bring that to leadership and hopefully you work in an organization where leadership will listen to you and respond accordingly. So I think, I think I, that eats up my time. Thanks, Brian. And I'll just interject a little clarity. I, I'm glad. And um, that is my camp nickname, short for McGladry, in case everyone's like, well, who's this glad person who just kept, who ran into, who cares? So I'm sorry, it just slips out. <laughs> it's okay. And Melis will do the same. So we just, we're going to, cat's out of the bag. That's my nickname. Melis. Well, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I remember your first question to me is like Melis, where do you notice stress injury impacting avalanche educators? And my answer was like Laura, I notice a lack of curriculum is impacting our students, and that ties back to an experience I had in October 2017. Um, we had instructors kind of canvassing Anchorage, giving free one hour public awareness talks using a no before you go slideshow to Anchorage students. And at the end of those, our instructors hand out these little slips. And we ask like, what did you like? What did you not like? What would you like to see in one of these presentations in the future? So can I had a stack of these evals I was going through. And on two of them, um, students had said like, oh, but you never talked about what to do after a rescue or you never mention what to do if my friend does die in an avalanche. And I was really dismissive. I was like, what do these people think we can do and accomplish? Like in a one hour free awareness talk, like 
what an unreasonable expectation. And it was just a few days later, I read the tragic news about Hayden Kennedy, who was in an avalanche accident with his partner and had shortly after taken his own life. And kind of that sequence of events got me thinking, like, what can we do to give people tools within their avalanche education to have reasonable expectations of that reality of that stress that's on them? Because we do hammer in, like, you are the rescue. If you don't do this, nobody else will. If you don't get to them in this certain number of minutes, they're going to die. And then it's like mic drop and we don't say anything else. And it's, you know, the truth is it's it's not really a delay in our education to say a few helpful things. And in the case of like a no before you go student, um, it would just take one or two sentences to say, if you are a survivor of a fatal accident, it's important to not go home alone. Mm. Seek out friends, seek out family right away, because initially it's going to feel overwhelming and it may feel unbearable. Mm. Thanks, Melissa. That's really powerful. <clears throat> um, and I think probably resonates with a lot of us. So um, our second question then tonight is, what have you done then um, to innovate stress awareness or mitigation of stress impact into your programs? And particularly, I think, you know, hopefully people will hold our feet to the fire on this one. Um, how have you attempted to keep those innovations efficient achievable and embedded in your existing culture instead of inventing a whole other program or doing something that I think a lot of us don't have the time or the bandwidth for. So Tucker, I'm gonna send that back to you. All right. Um, here we go. So for our program, you know, I recognize that operationally um, a SAR program functions very differently than a guiding program and uh, forecasting program, ski patrol. Uh, there are some commonalities though. And uh, one of them I think that is important to keep in mind is like, it's a culture and that culture uh, operates based on um, what it like kind of came with, uh, what you as a new person bring to it. Um, and so that culture can change. Um, I think in the SAR world, you know, the gritty, keep it to yourself, suck it up mentality um, was embedded in that culture for a long time. And, you know, Brian was mentioning that the idea of like, well, how are you doing? You know, the common answer is I'm fine. Um, so really to shift that culture, you need to, you, it's the answer. It's feeling comfortable to answer that question, honestly, that really is where that culture shift starts. And so, um, asking the question, the question may not change. Like, how are you doing? That's an honest um, question and it deserves an honest answer. Um, and how that looks, I think, is is where you, you focus in on your culture. And it's going to be different for every organization. For ours, um, it kind of starts with awareness is how we broke it down. Awareness, common language, implementation, follow-up, and then ultimately it's the connection that you build within that, that, that solidifies it. So um, we started with awareness, which was we brought, um, as these topics were coming up and we all kind of peer to peer, we're saying, yeah, you know, like this stuff's really getting to me and maybe uh, we need to address it on a, on a larger scale. And so um, we brought up Responder Alliance and uh, Glad came up and gave us kind of the 101, um, what's like how to identify the feelings that you're having and put some language to it. And so that um, common language that's out of the uh, stress continuum here was really the starting place for us. It really gave us language to use um, that communicated, you know, all of us in our professions really put a lot of emphasis on good communication. And this is no different. And so having colors, you know, that's, that's an easy thing for rangers and ski patrollers and forecasters, like we're used to that. So like, I think the color spectrum, and then having some definition and wording below it. Um, so that when I say I'm in the green, we all that comes with a lot behind it. 
um, but maybe it's just one word, but it has a lot of power to it because it kind of falls into these. If we look at this stress continuum here um, in the green, that's that's what I'm saying. And I only need one word to really express that. Uh, it's a lot easier if you're not doing well to say I'm in the orange or in the red than really going into what the problem is, because maybe that's a conversation that's offline or with somebody else or whatever it is. Um, so the common language uh, gave us that starting place. Uh, we took it into our risk management tool that we use. It's a kind of a park service wide tool. Park service is a, you know, part of the Department of the Interior. It's a massive organization. Uh, and a lot of the policy and risk management is all kind of top down. Uh, and, and this is embedded in this thing called operational leadership, which I'm not going to get into. But there's a risk management tool embedded in there that came from the Coast Guard. It's called the GARD, Green, Amber, Red. And uh, it it allows you for any in, any um, operation or search and rescue or anything that you're going into, you can like use it as your risk uh, checklist, basically. And so this one, uh, the GAR over here just kind of breaks it into these large categories, supervision, planning, team selection, team fitness, communication, contingency resources, environment, and complexity. And so anything that we do, we, we break it down into these and we assign it a number and we're, we're moving that into colors as well. Um, cause it's all kind of standard now. So like if you're, if it's a green, it's don't worry about it. If it's a, uh, yellow, it's like, we need to come up with some mitigation to, uh, move forward. And if it's a red, it's, it's all stop and we need a new plan. Uh, so what we did is we took the stress continuum to kind of start embedding it into the culture and getting that language um, standardized for our rangers is that we, in the team fitness category for our daily GAR, we put it there and we just started using it. Um, and we kind of go around the table. Uh, we'd call up to the different camps on Denali and see how, and people would just give us a color and it would give us a kind of a broader understanding of how people were doing. Uh, so that's how we started like implementing into the culture. And I, I got to say, it worked pretty well at first, and then it didn't work as well. So I think that there's a level of flexibility um, as we implement and as we change culture that, you know, if it's not working, then scrap it, figure out a different way to do it. Uh, and so we we got the language embedded and then we were able to remove it from that category and we use it in another way now. Um, so that's our uh, common language. Um, we moved into, uh, implementation. Uh, we've adopted this psychological first aid in the field, um, similar to what Mellis was talking about. Like, what do you do when you're on scene and the family's there or the climbing partners there? Like, can we help at that level? And so we've kind of put some emphasis on like what we can do on scene that may not be like tip of the spear doing medical treatment, but I can deal with the climbing team um, separately. Uh, we took, we also took the incident support tool, and I think we'll get into some of these later of what they actually are. Um, incident support tool, um, we put it into our after action review. So every incident has an after action. And now we actually look at it and we um, not only look at what we did well, what we didn't do well operationally, that it's a traditional after action review, um, but we were missing a component to it. And now we've got this in it where we look at like, how did this affect our ranger on scene or in the SAR room, the incident commander? And then what was the incident itself? And these, again, on a color uh, scale of how impactful it was. So then when we do our after action, we're like, well, maybe this one had some critical elements to it, like family contact. Um, it was super long duration. It was super complicated. The injuries were really substantial. We can assign it a red. And then then we move into the next piece, which is our um, like 333 exposure tool. So these were all things that were created and we just like adopted them and fit them to our needs and use them um, that work for us. Because you ha we have to have buy-in from the rangers to use it. And so if it's not if they're not buying into it, then it's useless. Uh, and we, we need to find a different way to do it. And it seems like organically works better than a top-down mission. So having buy-in from the field, um, embedding it in easy places to use it, 
uh, has been really effective for us. So 333 is kind of our follow-up. We've also taken one step further and um, contracted a uh, this group called Behind the Sun Therapeutics. And we have um, two uh, licensed clinical social workers, PhDs that are available to our team. Um, so th those folks are, you know, you don't have to talk to a supervisor or anything. They're just, there's a call number and they can go um, talk to those folks. Uh, the last thing, connection, I think is, is kind of the core thread through it all. And so we try to really uh, promote peer-to-peer um, -peer connection. A lot of times the easiest person to talk to is the person that uh, knows your job the best. Peer-to-peer um, -peer works really well. Um, that can be done on its own, checking in with each other. And then lastly, we um, have kind of taken a step further, especially for leadership roles um, here um, across work groups. So there's other people in my position that don't work at this park that are friends of mine that I can reach out to. And then we've also helped with the heli industry here in Alaska when they've had accidents using our resources coming to us uh, so that we can provide support um, that way. Thanks, Tuck. And I think a great example of a dispersed team somewhat, a dispersed seasonal team, as many avalanche centers can be, or, um, you know, there, we I think these examples of like how these tools use over you know, at, at base and 14 and seven camp, having those preloaded operational languages and procedures can be really helpful. Um, I think Brian, um, over to you. I think you're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But you're gonna have to unmute yourself. Thanks. Can you go to uh, the few slides I've used as prompts? And so much like uh, you can go to the, yeah, stop there. So much like uh, Tucker was just talking about, you know, we did not reinvent the wheel. We kind of took some of these tools that were already in existence and that GLAD and the Responder Alliance have worked on to build this resiliency program. And when I start, we first started kind of batting these things back and forth, um, GLAD really encouraged us to make this our own. So in other words, these tools are, in existence, but they're not catered for, you know, individual specific operations. And she challenged us to take that on. And so naturally we thought about stress the same way we do about avalanches. And so you can see our resiliency program was really about stopping cracks from becoming avalanches or to extend the metaphor, you know, stress injury. I'm um, going go to the next slide. And so the first thing she did was like, well, you should make your own stress continuum because this is just language that we put, um, that we adopted from stress continuums that came out of the military. And we did this for essentially, you know, like search and rescue groups and outdoor professionals, but we've never done one for, you know, like a forecasting operation or avalanche professionals specifically. So we wanted to build a framework, just like Tucker mentioned, that gave us a common vocabulary in a place that we could at least reference so that um, when we said we were at a level moderate or in the green or in the red, we knew what that meant. Um, and so we, of course, gravitated towards the North American Public Avalanche Danger Scale because we live and breathe that thing um, all season long. And we thought there was a good analogy there um, for stress um, in avalanche workers. And so, you know, we put it into this stress continuum with the four levels. The content that's in there, the behaviors, traits, and feelings was filled out um, by the whole group. So we solicited input from everyone that works at the CAIC. They added what they think should go in each category, essentially. Like, what does green mean to you? Um, what does orange mean to you? And we collected a list of responses from everyone that works here. And then we tried to synthesize and call them down and come up with language that fit in each category for us, for our operation. And this may, you know, this may transfer quite well to other forecasting centers. It might not, right? They might need to build their own language around there. Um, it depends on the specific culture of the operation you work in. The language that's developed here was for avalanche forecasters in our operation, but it may transfer quite well to other groups that are doing different kinds of things. Um, and an important 
component of this for our group was to have the travel advice column in there. In other words, our group is very focused on, I think this is part of the culture, maybe part of the job. It's like, great, now what? Like, what do I do? Um, which is how Glad and I kind of started this conversation. And she could tell you how myopic I was in insisting I needed a roadmap for how to implement this. And so you can see we've got travel advice associated with each level on the stress continuum. And so that's what we use as our common language framework that we can reference. Um, you can go to the next one, Ben. Um, and this was uh, a stress injury equation that Glad had introduced me to. And I think what I really liked about it was it includes both the depletion stress or what I was referred to as like chronic stress or to extend the avalanche analogy, the incremental loading on the snowpack with the traumatic stress, which is the rapid loading, um, the accident response, um, the body recovery, the things like that. Um, and all of these are additive um, and can lead to stress injury. Um, so you can go to the next one, go ahead. Uh, one, one back one. Next one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So for the acute stress, we took the incident support tool as developed. So just like Tux Group, um, this is what we use to debrief and essentially get the process rolling as a touch point after essentially potentially traumatic events. And it's Glad and I have just been talking over the last week. So like last year was our first year implementing this stuff. And we had eight fatal avalanche, eight fatalities, eight incidents, I should say, that resulted in avalanche fatalities. And so we went through this incident support tool um, eight times because we had various levels of involvement from you know, essentially just doing interviews to you know being on scene, recovering the body, extended time with family members and survivors, um, that kind of thing. And Glad challenged me to think more broadly about how we're using this tool. She's like, so there were only eight things all year that were potentially traumatic. I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, there was other stuff that happened, but that's like part of the job. And I can find, I found myself saying it and feeling myself being grounded and being like the old crusty guy, like, yeah, that's part of the job, but yeah, there's probably other stuff. I mean, we had a hundred incidents here last year and incidents are people caught in moving avalanche debris. And some of those are nothing. People got caught and skied out of it. And some of them are like near death experiences. And yet we didn't use this tool for any of those. And I'm just recent, I'm just now within the last several days kind of rethinking um, how we might use this a little bit more broadly. Certainly, I don't want to use it 100 times for every time someone gets caught in it moving avalanche debris, but there's some balance there. Um, it certainly doesn't need to be a fatality to be potentially traumatic. And so I am now wrestling with that question about where the line is. So we probably will use this a little bit more expansively this year. And I think the fact that it was so narrowly applied to fatalities just reveals my entrenchment in a culture that sucked it up and went to the bar. Um, and I, I'm, I'm working to get out of it. I think as Tuck touched on, the incident support tool is, is kind of nice. It's really easy to use. Uh, this is an example of one that put me over kind of the, the, the key score. So this was extend you know, body recovery, people I knew, extended time with the body, family members, survivors, so on and so forth. And I got to admit, when we first started using this tool, you know, you score the, your response to the incident and you, and you score the incident itself. And you just give these things, you know, zero fives or tens. And when I first went through this, incident support tool, I think I gave myself like a 35 on this thing. I wasn't practiced with it. Um, and so I just undershot, I just like underscored stuff because that's how my brain was thinking. And so then it was my kind of, I think maybe first or second one. So I called Glad and I'm like, can we go through my scores on this stuff? I just want to make sure we're doing this right. And she's like, wait, you did what? And like, <laughs> this all happened and that's a 35. Like, that doesn't sound right. Like, let's go through each category. And this is my revised score, which I think is certainly more appropriate. So it, it does take some practice, especially if you're used to kind of minimizing potentially traumatic events. It's you don't get you don't just bust out of that pattern because you got this new tool. Um, you're still going to minimize things if that's your proclivity. And I found myself doing that. Um, that's not to say everyone on our staff treated it the same way, but that was certainly my experience. 
And so if you get a score greater than 40, greater than or equal to 40, or, and we keep this wide open, if a staff member just wants follow-up and requests it, then we will implement the three by three by three, regardless of how they score. And so then we go into the three by three by three exposure protocol, which Tuck touched on. Um, you touch base with people that were involved in any capacity, even if they were like incident support in the office at kind of three days, uh, three weeks and three month waypoints. Um, you can see that I had a score of over 40. So this initiated this process. Um, a lot of our incidents didn't even require this next step. Um, people were being like, you know, it was fine. I didn't know these people. I, they were gone by the time I got there. All I did was some interviews. I'm totally fine. And then we stop there. We don't even go to this uh, three by three by three exposure protocol. But if you do, you check in at three days, you start making a plan for moving back towards green by making green choices, implementing your travel advice that works for you. And you develop a plan with essentially your stress buddy on our team. But the three week checkpoint brings in the next tool, which is the traumatic stress questionnaire. And you can go to that, go ahead. Um, and you fill this out at three weeks. Um, and so you go through these 10 questions and you can see if you get a score over six, or you answer yes to six or more of these questions, it, it would suggest you might need some further clinical support. Um, in none of our incidents last year, did we ever score over a six? So I gotta tell you, this was like a relief for me. Um, implementing this thing for us, I think in the management team was like, oh my God, we're already asking our staff to do so much uh, through the operational season. And now we're going to add a stress resiliency program. And I was quite concerned that implementing a stress resiliency program was going to in and of itself induce stress. Um, and I did not want that to happen. Like, you know, I didn't, I've been on the receiving end of this stuff where I've been involved in a, and I've talked to numerous people, including glad about this, where I've been involved in an accident and I get 50 phone calls and text messages with people checking in on me and I'm stressed out by everyone checking in on me. And so like, I didn't want uh, the resiliency program to do the same thing. And the good news was that like, it's super easy to implement. It's not at all time consuming. And that most of the time, like you just proceed as normal. And I found that as a giant relief because I was, I adamantly believe that not every traumatic event causes stress injury. Some people have traumatic exposure and they're just fine. That can happen. Um, they're not burying it. They're not wadding it up and stuffing it down to only blow up later. Some people can effectively manage this stuff on their own. And this really pointed to the utility of this process for me. And it's that it's identifying those few instances um, where that's not happening. And it identifies those few instances where someone actually does need additional support. And so as a program manager, it was a relief because most of the time you just move on as normal, even in the wake of potentially traumatic events. So I found this a, a great utility and it doesn't mean we have to sit around and talk about our feelings after every workplace incident. Um, again, giant relief for a guy like me. Um, and if you can go to the next one, I think I might be done. That's it for now. Thanks, Brian. Yep. Yeah. yeah, excellent. And Again, um, some time for follow-up questions here after Melis um, brings it home for us. So Melis, tell us about your innovations. Yeah, well, there's uh, two things that I've been working on. One is, you know, trying to think about where to take some of these concepts and where they're appropriate, what education levels. And so I've been taking a trickle-down approach with that. So one of the highlights of my job is having Alaska Avalanche School be an A3 pro provider. And twice a year, you know, what is now the six kind of big avalanche schools in the country come, come together and we decide, you know, the standards for pro curriculum, things to protect avalanche workers. And so it's this really nice working group and we've been together for a long time and it seemed like a really easy place to start because what we do know is avalanche workers are at a really high risk group. And so we can kind of hit this with um, tools that are already in place and and wiggle it into the curriculum. And so a couple of years ago, I introduced this, the other providers were really all on board. And I believe this is happening at the pro level across the country. I'm really excited that A3 has just invested so much into it and 
Uh, I think now with Jason Simon Jones on board, like it might be time to start thinking about how we could do this at the recreational level uh, with those students where we can really kind of tease out the simpler concepts. Like for instance, with psychological first aid, there's ABCs for psychological first aid and the way there are for other things. And we can kind of keep the terms and concepts pretty simple. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that my ideas for the next stage would be, you know, co coaching providers through having really realistic drills for their students, um, some rules of thumb around identifying and peer-to-peer um, -peer treatments for stress injuries, how we can talk about readiness during trip planning, because we're all teaching our rec students trip planning tools. And so, yeah, that's kind of the next frontier on that. And then the second thing that I'm doing is an actionable tool by virtue of been part of these conversations with the Responder Alliance for over three years now, they've built this wonderful site um, that has all access to all their tools and it's available to work groups. And you can actually like release different courses to your employees. But what's really nice for me is, you know, we have an emergency response binder, like please, I hope this never happens to us, but we have a lot of risk management tools in place that if there was a critical incident during one of our education courses, like we have a mapped out response. But I think what everybody underplays is how hard it is if you're rescuing your own and your cells. And we've seen that in Alaska, like we're a really tight knit community and you get kind of a pivotal person or a personality and the coworkers, it's not realistic expectation that they could do all the steps and things that need to happen after a critical incident. And so for our Alaska resiliency site, um, we've expanded beyond just Alaska Avalanche School and we've asked select members of search and rescue teams and ski patrols and some forecasting centers to each contribute a member so that if any one of our work groups has an incident with was need some kind of critical response that we could jump in and help. And you would have somebody that's like a step removed to be able to do kind of some of the initial work that you would need in a response. That's so funny, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, Nellis, thank you. And that one, I think, uh, may generate some interest for folks in Alaska who are also leading um, snow workers, you know, how to get involved in that, but a really incredible innovation. So, um, man, that gives us a lot of food for thought and I a uh, lot to add there, but now let's um, send it back to you, Scott, and open it up to the audience. Great, thanks so much, Laura. Um, so yeah, we really do want to encourage a lot of questions during the Q and A, um, which we're getting into now. So if, if anyone has one, just another, uh, some quick instructions on how to ask your question. It's an amazing opportunity to, to bounce questions off our both expert and in, in at least one case, a self-proclaimed non-expert panelist. So you can click the raise hand button at the bottom of your, uh, zoom screen and we'll call on you and ask you to unmute. So if you do ask a live question, we just ask that you please keep it uh, fairly concise. And no problem if you're uncomfortable asking the, a live question, you can type it into the Q&A pop-out that should be at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And you can feel free to also direct your question at any specific panelist if you desire. Otherwise, we'll leave that up to Laura and the panelists to decide how they want to field questions. So we're starting to get some uh, some stuff going here. Uh, let's see. So the first question, why was the three chosen for Responder Alliance's 333 incident support system? Why not one or two? So is there clinical evidence for the choice of three? Brian, I'm sure you want to take that question, don't you? <laughs> um, I, maybe I'll take that one um, because it's around the, the clinical evidence, unless Tucker, you were hoping to get in on that. Um, so uh, I'll try not, I'll try and be concise and not professorial here, but um, really the, the challenge, the problem we were trying to solve is that many debriefing um, rituals that many of us have used over time, myself as a rescuer over many years, 
actually occur in that first week when we're already overwhelmed and our greatest need is for reorientation. So we get together, but um, to connect and all sorts of good things happen there, but um, it's, it is normal to not feel normal and to actually be um, need more calibration in that moment. That three week mark is where we, you know, so if you think about the first week is where everyone is, um, is not themselves because they're having to adjust to whatever they just saw. The three week mark is when we see people either start to return to their baseline or stay at an elevated level of arousal. And those people who stay at that elevated level of arousal, that three to four week, that kind of starts to indicate that that stress impact did not resolve on its own. And the three month actually um, is when that that in the literature is kind of that first window of time where people resolve on their own um, without needing other interventions. So the idea was to catch people at that last three. And you'll notice that there's not like a big intervention to do. It's a check-in and, and encouraging self-awareness. So folks who in all of our fields have we're on deployment, for instance, um, with the Jolly program or at the CIC or AAS, and they're on to other things. My ski patrol, for instance, if something happens in March, by the time we get to that three month mark, people have dispersed. And it was one more chance to check in with each other and say, hey, did you make it back to yourself or would you like some more support? And hey, I was there and to put fixed point operational check ins out a little bit further. So that's a bit of an innovation, but it is reflected in what the literature shows us, those waypoints when we should be monitoring folks. Scott, shall I send it back to you for the next one? Um, I'm pushing a few of them via the uh, the chat, if you look on that, Laura, so they're, they're queued up for you. All right, very good. Um, so next question. Um, I'm part of the um, IPAC IPAC Friends Board. What would you recommend as um, a first step or introduction to PFA um, and survival guilt in, sorry, I can't get that last word here on my screen. I'm gonna work on this, but what's in rec education, I think is how that goes. So that's correct. Okay, um, great. Who, who wants to pick that one up? Melis. Yeah, I so the Responder Alliance, they have a wonderful online psychological first aid course and at least get one member of your team through it. But just some general ideas that like anybody on this video could use is uh, one of the things they teach you is like body language, good listening skills, people that feel listened to. What you're trying to do is try to make somebody feel safe right away. The, the critical incidents happened. And so now we're trying to trigger an AOK -okay signal. So this doesn't leave like a bad marker on somebody actually using the word safe frequently can kind of plant in somebody's brain. Uh, they might ask you questions. Oh, I, I might not be able to walk again, or I'm never going to see my friend again. And to frame things really positively, kind of like make an important mark on somebody where it says, well, the good news is uh, we know this highly qualified medical team is on its way. You should be to the hospital in this amount of time. In the case, I, you know, I'm just taking some wild examples, but if you're with somebody when they die, it's, you know, you can frame it. It's not everybody that gets to be with somebody when they die. It's special to be with somebody during their last moments. Like, let's take what we know and communicate that to best as possible with people that didn't have this opportunity to be here. And so there's, you know, those are just some quick and dirty ideas, but I would highly recommend taking like an online psychological first aid course, or at least going to the Responder Alliance site. And they have a cue card for like psychological first aid. I was trying to look it up so I could screen share while we were chatting, but I, I couldn't drum it up quickly enough. But there's a couple of quick things that'll just click for you, probably even short of taking a class, just being cued to good actions. Thanks, Melis. And yeah, I think from the psychological standpoint, all of those things drive toward the brain firing off the all clear signal. Like, hey, I made it through that. It's over for me. I'm still here, which starts when we talked about that 333 three process, that's how your brain can kind of stand down from that high threat perception. So thanks for all those great examples. Um, and I asked Scott to put the Respond Alliance on website um, in the chat. Um, so the next question is, 
how have you changed your culture among first responders who use common vocabulary and to use that stress continuum colors? What kind of mechanisms and routines have you developed? Um, I think I can I can offer yeah. one one <laughs> one thing that we've done, which again, you know, yeah. part of the course for me, we just stole from somebody else. So one of the folks that came to work for us came from the Eldora Ski Patrol. And he was the one who was asking me about developing a stress resiliency team. And so what Eldora had been doing was um, a survey. Um, and so we took their survey, which they kindly gave to us, and then just modified it for our own operation. And so the way we have built in the use of the stress language, particularly kind of just for the, the day in, day out of working, is we use a monthly stress survey. So it takes people like, you know, maybe five, 10 minutes max, and they answer a series of questions and they rate themselves kind of where they are on the stress continuum by like category. And then we review the all anonymous and then we meet as a group because we're all scattered um, around the state, um, but we meet as a group once a month and then we review the responses so everyone can see the temperature of the team. Um, and everyone's using that same language to help them fill out the survey. And I thought what was really interesting for us was that, yeah, you don't know individual responses, but you might be able to see that there's people on the team in an unhealthy place right now. And so that encouraged kind of more just follow-up and interaction and touching base with the people you work most closely with. And it was eye-opening for people to realize, like, even though they might feel fine and feel like they're in the green, it was illuminating for them to know there were certain staff members that might not be. And it might be around things like field work or staff communication. Mm -hmm. And so we found that survey quite helpful for us as a monthly check-in. Um, so that's that's one way we've embedded that into the culture. That's great. Now, I'll just add to that, that anytime, I mean, every time um, we think about embedding these, we've used this word efficiency a lot, but it has to kind of get into a fixed point or a practice or a ritual that you already, it's kind of a tiny habit for those of you um, nerds on behavior change, but just has to sort of be embedded in a morning meeting or some kind of operational practice that you already do and it can't add more than a few moments, but that's been really helpful. Um, let's go to that next question. Um, huge thanks to our panelists and moderators. Thank you. Um, I really like the app that Snowmass Patrol developed. Um, shout out to Gavi Banal. Is it is there this is an open source app or are there other open source apps available? Um, hey Greg, Gabby's attend. I see him on the attendee list. No, but we see. can't get him in here. I think. Oh, so I, well, I, I, really, I can talk I for him. Yeah. Gabby, you can text me if I blow this. Um, but yes, he Gabby has just re kind of rebuilt this app. Um, he just launched it for Android as well. So you can get it. I don't think it's in this. If it's not in the store, it will be soon. He's got a list of organizations. You could probably add your own. Um, and so he's got this app available and he's been sharing it. So I've just been kind of beta testing it with our group. And this takes like seconds to fill out. Essentially, you open the app. Um, the functionality of the app is one, you kind of select, um, you know, just your color for the day. So you could do this like snow mass, snow safety team was doing this on a daily basis last year. It's a really high time resolution data. So you can start to track trends and in team and individual stress that, you know, might be related to gnarly accidents or storm events or inbounds avalanches, whatever it may be. Um, and it's also got the incident support tool um, where you can fill it out right on the app and then just generate a PDF, which can go into like a, an archive or database for you. And so if people don't know how to get a hold of Gabi, they can certainly reach out to, um, to me. And if you don't know my contact, just get it through uh, the AAA or just go to the CAIC website. But uh, that app's uh, available. And thanks to Gabi for, for building such a cool tool. Yeah, thanks, um, Brian. I'll just add that the app, um, the results um, from some of that data gathered are in the ISSW proceedings that we we pinned here. If folks want to find those out and um, or not to throw Gabby too far under the bus, the app is definitely in beta testing right now. So I think reaching out to share your interest would be awesome, but I don't think you can download it yet, like in, on the on the store. So it'd be great if you have a team that you think would like to to help to beta test that. All right, so on to our next question. Thanks for the thoughtful presentation um, about plans to react to potentially traumatizing events. 
Curious about um, of the panelists, your thoughts on building resilience to those events in addition to identifying and reacting um, to injury. What makes a worker able to stay in the green or yellow after an event rather than the orange or red? I really liked um, Jess Shade's thoughts on flexible mindset at ProSaw. Shout out to Jess Shade. If anyone else caught that, but keen for thoughts along those lines, thanks to you panelists. So those of you, again, from this leadership standpoint and yourselves watching folks kind of come from those two aspects of being in, in the um, green going into a season or watching as it happens midway, what thoughts are coming up, panelists? I can touch on that one. Um, I think it, it, you kind of have to take a look at it in terms of like what the, um, I like Brian's word, temperature of the of the group and team members are. And I think um, coming into the season is very different than mid season is very different than later in the season. And I think as a manager, at least um, having uh, some sort of metric to figure out where people might be at and then allowing them to have the flexibility to make uh, green choices that will steer them more towards the green. So that might be uh, simple things like time off. It might be uh, a chairlift ride, um, uh, you know, like not having to check in at the top shack for a couple runs or whatever it ends up being. Um, those, those little things, um, can really help shift somebody's mindset uh, at the right time if you're if you're at least um, gauging where people are at. Um, I don't know if other folks have ideas on that. Yeah, I, you know, Tech, that's um, I think that's really helpful. I think there's a, a few more questions coming down the pike that are variations. So maybe we'll go to Jane for a live question and then circle back to those. Yeah, Sydney Badger has a live question. So Sydney, if you unmute, you can ask. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes. great. Hi, thank you all so much. Um, my question I think is on the same theme, but I was just curious specifically about when we recognize depletion stress when operations need to really keep going, just yeah, conversation about mitigating that while mid-season. Mm. Yeah, I, I'll, I can, I'll speak from you know, just what I observe in our group, but uh, it's it's super real i mean and so we've just tried to take like baby steps it, there's no way to get, solve this problem completely it's like if you're in the midst of like for us you know some two week storm cycle which has happened um it's it's just hard like right? and so you know it's really you got to go into event you have to be ready to go into those events so you can't just react to depletion you've got to prepare for it so that you know it's coming at some point in the season, um, every season. And so you've got to be taking care of yourself in those moments where, in those periods of the season where you can, so that when something happens, you're starting with a full battery. Um, and then when you start to run into depletion stress, it's a matter of, for us, I think baby steps like rotating, like, you know, we're not sending, like, we tr really try not to, sometimes it just happens, but like, the same person to two accidents right in a row. So we try to rotate that among the staff. Um, and then it's just a matter of like, man, someone's been like on this stretch of highway for like eight days straight, like we're going to tag out. Um, so it's a little bit of self-awareness of your other team members, but I can't emphasize enough going into this with a full battery because you just have a, you get a longer run at it before you start to really feel like you're at your wits end. Um, and then just rotating responsibility. So I can't say there's a magic bullet there, but that that's been, somewhat helpful for us. Thank you. Yeah, that's, a, that's a powerful statement too, that we actually have some efficacy about how long we can make it through a stressful season, depending on how we go into it and sort of how much charge. So, um, and I think all of you have reflected somehow a version of having, even if you can't change the stress impact in that moment, Brian, I'm thinking 2019, March, you at least are aware that you see the stress accumulating and that there's going to be a point where you can write that, or there is a green somewhere that you might be able to find. Yeah. And I think it's like in all of these jobs, I mean, we all got into this field like for, because it's a passion. If anyone got into this for the money, you've made a terrible mistake, <laughs> but like, you know, we all got into this because we love like doing this work. And so it's, it's a really hard thing to turn off. And so I've, we've really been trying to emphasize like you have quiet periods 
seize those periods, go ski for fun, take a few days off, work a 40 hour week, my God, you know? Um, and so I've been, got, I've gotten better at identifying the quiet periods and really trying to seize and take advantage of those to recharge my battery. Great. And that, that starts to answer a few other questions coming up just around what are three things that you'd recommend to keep us, you know, green during a stressful season. And I think really elevating the importance of that work-life balance, the awareness to know when it's getting off balance, and then also having this kind of built in as you've named. Um, here's a next question. I'll see if anyone here has ideas. You can take it. Um, Scott, you could um, address this as well. We're all we're an all volunteer organization. Any thoughts on how to get funding or grants to implement some of these systems um, across our organization and expand the funnel into greater community rather than just paid department or organizations who can afford the work? A question that haunts us all. I don't know if I have an answer, but I could certainly offer like anything you saw that like we've developed or that Laura's got a lot of this is just freely available. And so this wasn't a big time or a financial investment on, on our part to implement this kind of stuff. And uh, we're happy to share like what we've done. So you might be able to do this for little to no cost. So I'm not sure you need to go looking for big dollars. Yeah, and probably to add to that, I mean, I want to um, shout out to A3, the Resiliency Fund, because some folks have come to us and used to that um, Resiliency Fund dollars for training or to build a site, for instance, one of the sites that you've seen, or to take courses on themselves or get courses for other people after an incident. Um, Responder Alliance has also started a foundation this year trying to capture um, some of the, especially for the research side, because one of the, our big, you know, challenges, I think for all of us is how do we know that it's working? And that's why we appreciate things like ISSW and holding our feet to the fire to analyze, um, the results. But, um, a lot of people have found very creative, um, ways we are seeing like the larger organizations actually start to buy into these tools from a retention and a risk standpoint. And so that, has been very helpful in getting funding to say, okay, fine, you're not into resiliency, but how much are you spending on turnover? How much is risk worth for you? Does this increase or support risk? And that's been helpful too. Melissa, did you have something to throw out there too? You look like you were thinking about it. No, I actually don't. Okay. Um, I think one of the things lessons learned for us um, over the years of implementation is that it actually does take money to do this, but once an organization has found that way or their leadership says this matters enough, it really does help kind of codify, like we've invested in this, let's go for it. So, and then always we think, and that's why I think having things like when Denali program did that, that opened it up for the other climbing ranger programs in the park to just follow suit um, with the tools. So um, for someone who's been an avalanche worker for their whole career, any suggestions for differentiating chronic stress injury and more general job burnout? Seems like there's an overlap in those signs and symptoms. And maybe the simplest answer to that one is that um, burnout was the only language we had for a long time. And stress injury language makes it a little bit more nuanced, right? You can have early signs or you could have stress impact before you're actually burned out. But uh, panelists, anything to add there? I think that's they, they're, they're, um, burnout's probably in those kind of uh, the common word that we used before we had more nuanced language, yeah, I think. All right, here's one for Tucker. Tucker, you mentioned, Tucker, are you ready for this one? Uh, you mentioned that you were using the stress continuum as a check-in for team fitness and it was working well until it wasn't. What didn't work and how would you? How did you change it? What'd you do instead? So, um... We we're trying to get the language embedded and that it worked really well for that. And that's what I touched on. I think where it, where we found it becoming cumbersome is that it ended up, um, you know, we were going around and giving our colors. And at the beginning it was really uh, uh, novel and new. And I think people were bought into it and that, but, but it kind of became a paperwork style exercise at a certain point. Like people were just throwing numbers out or letting our colors out and it wasn't, we weren't getting anywhere with it uh, at that point. And, you know, it's difficult because these things are not only your stress and your work, like your what's happening at home can also 
impact your general stress level. And, and so those two things go hand in hand. And I think where we were running into issues is like when we weren't mission driven, when things slowed down, it became more about what was happening around in your home life. And then when we had missions, it was more work-based. And so we had difficulties separating those two things. And so at that point, we decided to take it out of that team fitness realm um, and use it, use the language, but not necessarily always daily uh, get a uh, a color from everybody. A lot of those themes for people um, were, were consistently the same for weeks on end. And so um, I think that when we took it out, the language was still there. And that was the important part, even though um, it wasn't in our daily practice, it was in our culture at that point. Great, Tucker, thank you. And I think that's a great um, opportunity also to say like, sometimes, you know, once the language has been embedded, the language is embedded. Maybe you don't need as much of a ritual because you you have an operational sort of um, stop gap to just de to determine. Um, all right, so um, let me ask this question and then I'm gonna, um, Scott, maybe I'll have you answer the next one. I think this is on everybody's mind. I'm interested to hear what folks say. Using that stress continuum, how do you approach someone who appears to be in an elevated state like orange or red? It's not an acute incident, but rather a cumulative one, perhaps over the course of a career or a season. They're resistant to the stress continuum structure and tend to still hold the old school mentality of not wanting to talk about it. Um, if they do, then it turns out to be a negative perspective and then that can be uh, toxic to organizational culture. Any any insights or thoughts on that one? I can jump on that one too. I think that the uh, peer to peer at that point works really well. You have to find um, you know somebody to identify and connect with that with that person, and it's probably not a supervisor, and it's probably not somebody that doesn't know them that well. Uh, and it may not be even anybody within that organizational structure. It may be a friend, family member, something like that. And I think, um, you know, those, that's the person that does need it the most. And, and strangely enough, they tend to be the most resistant um, because they've been pushing it down for so long. They're afraid of what's going to come out and that it's going to affect them professionally um, and performance. You know, they, they're a high performer. Uh until they access those feelings. And so um, I think being really careful in um, who that peer-to-peer -peer person might be. Um, and you know, if somebody's not looking and asking, if they're not willing to ask for help themselves, um, then they, they can't get there. They have to at least have some willingness. And if the culture allows and, and has modeled vulnerability um, I think it it provides a more of a willing um, willing nature to be uh, able to communicate those things, and it yeah, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a tough one, and it's a that's in the far red category, and it's a it's a dangerous place, so it's a mm -hmm. place to be careful. Yeah, super insightful. I know this question's come up with a lot of um, of us here and teams that I've worked with. I think one other thing that has really helped me and it came up at ISW, um, Brian, I don't know if you remember in the Q&A, but um, this idea actually that the people, the farther you get into the red on that stress continuum, the more the vulnerability, the more people feel like people are looking at me because they're thinking I'm in the red. And I know I'm probably in the red and I hate this. And so I joke that sometimes, I mean, you might think that the stress continuum is bullshit because it's maybe it is bullshit, but a lot of people who push the hardest against it are the ones who um, don't want this conversation or the vulnerability to be coming out in culture. And I've just over time learned to switch that and be like, that's a great assessment tool. Um, because if you, if you switch burned out or crusty or angry or bitter with stress injured, um, then we could actually start helping and supporting people. So I I love to go into an organization and find out who the people who are who hate this the most, <laughs> because it kind of guides me to the folks who might actually need the most support um, when they're ready for that. So 
All right, I'm gonna, um, this question, Scott, I'm gonna head to you. Let me read this first, because I just I so appreciate it, this last comment. Um, I wish we had this sort of help support program back in 2003 when we lost a patroller during avalanche control. We were drunk zombies for days after the event. Thank you all. Um, and with that, Scott, I wanna hand this question over to you and see what you think about this, but what are what are three things that you recommend for all of us avalanche workers heading into a busy, and this panel, this can be an all play. I think this would be a, a really great um, question to sort of transition in, but um, what are the three things you recommend busy avalanche workers heading into a stressful, busy, long, and hopefully powder filled winter? Uh, give us three recommendations. Um, as it relates to, to staying, it sounds like um, more green or more uh, ready for for what's coming. Scott, what you got on this one? See, I, I thought you were uh, you were saying someone's name incorrectly there, or not calling <laughs> on me. Um, well, I can say I, I will take this from firsthand experience of doing things poorly last year, and myself and a lot of the my coworkers being yellow and orange for an extended period of time that one pay attention to how you're doing two pay attention to how your coworkers are doing and three do something about it which mm -hmm. we didn't do last year like as Brian and all of you have alluded to that it's not that difficult to do something and we're in the process of figuring out exactly uh what means we're going to take whether it's a an app based anonymous based or something different and I guess I'll kick it back to you with mm. that question that I have, the, the ultimate where the rubber meets the road is for a, a small, say, you know, three to five person operation where, you know, anonymity is, can be a difficult thing for someone if they're uncomfortable with it. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what, what are the, the simple first steps to implement some sort of a program, a resilience program. Mm. Yeah. You know, um, these questions come up a lot like, should we all share the stress continue with each other? I remember when the Denali program after the mountain shut down with COVID, it was like, we're all kind of just checking in every day, same colors, same thing. Like, how do we vary this up? And I think there's a lot of creative ways if you're using that language that you don't necessarily, it could be a self check-in or a partner check-in, but you could, um, I remember, I think it was Chris in the Denali program generated a list of questions based on this to ask each other. And we do this on our patrol, like, hey, what's a green choice you could make today that moves you forward? Um, what's pushing you to the red right now that I could take off your plate um, without saying, where are you or what direction are you facing? I think that can be really helpful. Um, but I'll tell you, if you are looking at this and being like, there is no way my my team or patrol or my group would adopt this. I think the, the point that I see in um, to culture change might be at the point of impact, maybe starting with tools for incident support, because we all have incidents and we all pretty much recognize we need support. Um, or psychological first aid or something skill-based that doesn't tackle the culture necessarily right away. Um, and I, I don't know, Brian, if you've thought about, I mean, I think you have kind of a similar issue and Tucker, you certainly do too. I mean, everybody knows probably who's pushing into the orange and who's pretty green just by nature of living life in Tuckeetna and being together. So I would say the more trust you have, the more you can just answer the question openly, the less trust, like the more you may make it anonymous. And if your culture is that small, I would say pick a, a skill or something and train on that together to see if it starts um, changing culture. Um, I, mean, I think that's right, Glad. That's like, you know, even, if, you know, we've got 30 people, but like, if you really want to dig and figure it out, like, you can. Um, so there's a big, there's a lot of trust, you know, built into this system. Like you'd have to dig and really want to try to find out who the person was. Um, and so we kind of just trust that we're not going to do that. And, you know, when Snowmass implemented the app last year, it was just for the snow safety team members. And so, you know, they may have only had, you know, four or five snow safety team members on, on a given day. And so there were four or five responses in the app. Um, and you might be able to figure out, you know, who that person was. It was like choosing red for that day, but you know, that might not be the worst thing in the end. It's like, there's anonymity in there, but if, you know, you see, keep seeing red dotted across the board, um, you, that, that the person will present themselves in, in other ways besides their response to a phone app. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One last way I can tell you the fastest way to kill this um, whole initiative. If you want to hear from lessons learned, um, is to link it to performance, 
right? Like that, and unfortunately, I think some of the early military, it might've been like, we're noticing your performance changes, you get in the red. What I've learned and have great respect for over these years of working with high reliability teams is that um, rescuers are gonna keep performing um, and they'll be at the end of a short haul, or they'll be out there um, throwing bombs or doing whatever into the red. And they're still gonna be excellent at it for the most part because they're giving everything they have. And it's just coming at great personal cost. So there has to be some kind of a cultural agreement that most of us will probably high mark somewhere in the orange or red in our career. And that's normal. We just want to find a way back, but it doesn't, it's never going to be a part of whether I put you, I know Todd, we've talked about that a little bit out on the rescue, or if I'm going to say, oh, I'm not sending you out today because it looks like you're in the orange. We all have to agree not to do that. It's really around kind of coming together and saying, we are collectively going to try and do as much as we can to keep all of us green at the end of the season but we know you're gonna perform no matter where you are on the stress continuum. And so with that, um, I thought one more time, Scott, I'm gonna hand it back to you, but I wanted to share, I think there is one more um, maybe innovation to bring up. Um, if folks want to take this um, incident support course um, that we've talked about tonight, we put a QR code in here just to make it available to folks for the next couple of weeks so you can get in there and train on it at no cost to get the skills that we talked about tonight. So um, that is maybe one other spot if you want to zap the QR code where you can just get in. Um, very often we have teams that come to us, it happened today, and they're like, hey, we're a ski patrol. We don't, our leadership doesn't believe in this. He thinks it's fairy dust. Uh, we want to do it. And so we just try to sneak courses out and get skills to people so that they can just go and embed and actually just start living and using the tools. And that seems to be what's cracking the door open to say, hey, something's better, something's changing. Um, let's do more of that. And with that, Scotty, I'm gonna hand it back to you. All right, thanks, Laura. Um, do we have any uh, final call for questions? Some great questions. Thank you to everyone in the audience who is. Yeah, sorry, we couldn't get to every single one of them. We tried to sum most of them up there to, to support. All right, I think Janie's gonna share a screen. We're just seeing uh, nothing up there right now, Janie. And we got a final thanks all the way from New Zealand. I don't know if you're seeing that, Laura and panelists. Right on. Yeah, and also thanks to the, many of the participants on this call, if they were on the panel, they'd be sharing. I mean, I see a lot of names that are already embedded or doing really good work out there. That's what we mean by it takes an army. So sorry that we we could have had a panel of 20 of you sharing some of the good work. Um, but hopefully we'll get to do this again. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I think Janie put it in the chat, the American Avalanche Association Resili Resilience Project provides support and resources for A3 members impacted by mental health challenges associated with avalanches, avalanche work, or avalanche accidents. So it does include a grant program as well. You can visit the A3 website to learn more about that. And then from Janie, the executive director of the A3, a, a huge thank you to all the industry supporting partners. And Janie, any last words? I think she's preferring to remain in the background. I can't figure out how to unmute myself. I'm sorry. I have so many screens going back here, you guys. IT, man, not my forte. Um, no, just thank you all. And yeah, huge thanks to our panelists. This was really, really perfect. Um, this will be recorded and we'll circulate it out to A3 members and ISSW attendees. Um, uh, probably next week sometime. So if you want to rewatch it or share it um, amongst yourselves, you are welcome to do that. So just stay tuned. Well, with that, a, a huge thank you to Laura, Mellis, Tucker, and Brian for uh, spending the time with with us and all and everyone in the audience. And uh, some more folks saying thank you so much in the in the Q and A. They're not questions. Just uh, seems like everything you had to share was really well received. So I'm sure there'll be people looking all of you up to ask you more questions. I, I would hope that this just primes the pump and gets people really moving in a, in a good direction with this. So thank you to everyone for attending. And uh, with that, I think we'll call it an evening.
Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.